welcome. Um, super excited to get to talk to you all um, about some experiences and experimenting that um, I have been doing. So I'm Kelly Mallory, for those of you who, who don't know me, and hi to those that I do know and that have supported me through all of this work. Um, so I am going to talk to you about some things that I've been trying in my current role in organization to create a learning culture using Toyota Kata. Um, so a little bit of background about me. I am an operational excellence manager at Viant Medical, which is a med device manufacturing contract manufacturer. Um, I have been here for about six or seven months, so it's still really new, but it's been really exciting. Uh, and I'm going to talk specifically about, you know, some, some things we are trying to introduce a learning culture. So let's dive right in. Um, I've been practicing Kata now for four to five years with the Kata Girl Geeks. Um, and then this last year with All in Alban, um, co-founded Kata School Northeast, and we're going to have our first in-person event coming up in October. So we've had a lot of practice uh, with the improvement in coaching Kata. And my experience in, you know, rolling it out to organizations has been a little bit limited. And so this was the opportunity to really try um, different methods to introduce the Kata and with the goal of creating a learning culture. So when I came into this work, I set a challenge up because I am a Kata geek. So our challenge, my challenge in this role is wouldn't it be wonderful if by December 31st, 2024, we have structures that engage everyone in improving their work every day so that we build a culture of learning and improvement where everyone feels valued. And this challenge statement uh, I crafted within the first month of working here and observing the current condition of how our people were engaging with learning and engaging with improvement. And from some of that initial current condition grasping, I saw that we don't have, or we did not have any structures that were active to engage people in improvement in their work, uh, nor did we have structures to support a culture of learning. And when I talk about a culture of learning, it's excitement to experiment your way forward and learn as you go compared to knowing the exact path and the solution that might take you there. So with this challenge in mind and understanding that it was really an open sandbox to play in, we started, I started thinking about how can I begin to engage my organization and my team in this thinking pattern. And going into this, I had a couple of expectations up front about the necessary immediate conditions that would have to occur. And the first is to have a culture where learning is important. You have to create a safe space for learning. And that means psychological safety. It means that we need to create time for learning. So find things that are um, not the most urgent things that we can learn about and work on to improve. And so that was condition one from an expectation perspective. And then the second one was wanting to get people excited about learning. Uh, and my expectation and hypothesis here was that if, if we could create the condition and the environment where learning was valued and people felt safe doing it, they would become excited about being in a learning environment and would be more engaged with their work and want to improve it more. So this was kind of what, what I was expecting going in. And through the first set of experiments that we ran, um, we found some pretty interesting things. But before we could really get into trying anything in our organization, we just talk about kind of what I consider a little bit of an elephant. So working in med device or any kind of highly regulated industry means there's a lot of red tape for a good reason. So I came from aviation previously. So we worked with the FAA and here it's the FDA. And these organizations and regulations are very important for safety and quality of the end user. And so it felt very constraining at first to say, what can we experiment on? Where can we make change? And everywhere I looked, it felt like we were bound by this red tape. And instead of getting 
bogged down by this, looking at it, decided, we decided to say, okay, we know that there are things we cannot touch because of regulation. We know that there will be things that we won't be able to just experiment on every day. So let's bound that. Let's get those in the open and understand what can we touch? What can we experiment on? What is gonna be safe and okay for us to do? So that when we begin to roll out uh, experimenting on our processes, we all have an understanding of what that looks like. So this was a really important first step as a leadership team going into this to say, what can we touch? What can we not touch? And so what we did was we started defining our sandbox. So we decided what are the things that we can play with in the sandbox and what are the things that we cannot touch outside of the sandbox. So one of the first things we agreed on, well, we, we need to make sure that we are not impacting production because the devices we make are critical to patients. So we need to maintain that. So whatever we do, however we experiment, we need to make sure that we continue with our current level of production. The next major thing that we determined was outside of our sandbox uh, was our work instructions. And this is our quality system that determines uh, how a product is to be made so that it is safe and functional for patients. So this was a, a very clear outside of the sandbox item. So we needed to make sure that we never deviated from any of the documentation from our quality system. We then decided that true to a lot of lean cultures, right? We didn't want to spend any additional money because a lot of the time, if we were going to make an investment like that, we would need to go through customers to ensure that they were um, involved and engaged and would provide some of that for us. And in the context of daily experimenting, that was gonna be another situation where that was outside of the bounds of what we could touch. And again, due to the nature of the work, we were in a situation where we needed to make sure we didn't have too many additional materials prepared ahead of time on any given line, because that would cause risks to quality of the product coming out. And that was a non-negotiable. So once our team was able to define the boundaries of our sandbox, we then could talk about, okay, what is in scope? What is in our sandbox that we can experiment against and play with? that doesn't affect these other elements. And the first one was we can 100% touch how we balance a labor on any given line. That is something that is fully in our control and it will not impact these other items. We then determined that we could play with material flow as well. So we know that we can change and adjust material flows inside of our normal processes, as long as that wasn't dictated by our standard quality documentation. And then the last thing was we know that we could move certain things. And so we drew a line on what was capable of moving and what was not capable of moving. And there are certain pieces of equipment that in our quality system were absolutely okay to move. And then there were certain ones that were not. So we, again, made sure we understood that fully before moving forward. And I would definitely recommend if you're going to pursue um, experimentation and developing a learning culture, really have a look at your process and determine and draw the lines on what can and cannot be touched. Because this is something that I had experimented with in a previous organization, and this was a massive hangup that caused it to fall flat. So first step, definitely define the boundaries of what you are able to experiment on. So then what we did from here is we had a, a team leader who we had a process and a product that we needed to make improvement on. And this was a great time and opportunity to introduce the concept of the improvement kata and how we wanted to approach experimenting with them um, in order to improve their line. So we brought them together with their supervisor and their support team, and we shared a challenge statement with them. So we gave them a challenge statement of by April 5th, 2024, the line that they were working on would now operate as a flow cell, achieving an output of 300 pieces per shift. 
And the reason was so that we could continue to grow and improve this relationship with this customer and win more business with them. And so this was a true thing that we were aiming for as a, an organization and team. And so we started this team leader with their challenge statement and making sure they understood what we were trying to achieve and why. And then we did a really brief introduction to the steps of the improvement kata. Very brief. Um, and in, in good news, I will say, the organization here has past experience with lean um, and improvement events. And they generally ran in a similar fashion to the overall steps of the improvement kata. So none of that was a massive surprise. And so when introducing this to them, it was easy to frame it in a way that aligned with the organization's previous experience with improvement. So if you have an organization where you're interested in rolling this out or trying this and they have no experience, it's going to come out a little different and probably end up a little differently than what I got to experience because of the history they had. And this can be a good or a bad thing depending on the nature of history and experience with the team or organization. So once we did this, once we introduced the challenge and what we wanted to try to achieve and the overall concept and structure of the improvement kata, the next was really diving into daily coaching with this team leader. And here is where I did not, and we did not do a full rollout of the storyboard or every starter kata, right? We started with two artifacts from the improvement kata, the coaching card and the experimenting record. And as we started working on this with this team leader, I would go through the standard five questions. And there were moments when I had to, you know, dig a little deeper in explaining what some of the terminology meant. But overall, walking through the coaching cycle day in and day out for those periods, those weeks that we worked on this, they began to familiarize with the language and knew in general what I was asking about and why I was asking about it. And we were able to set up daily experiments. And we did all of this over the course of four weeks, four or five weeks, and not one time aside from that first introduction did we call this kata on the floor. It was just, hey, we're going to do a daily coaching. You're going to set up an experiment to try to achieve this challenge that we had talked about. And we did set some intermediate target conditions so that she wouldn't feel like she was trying to take this whole big bite at once. But no storyboard, um, no full starter kata for anything. And this was just to get the introduction to that scientific thinking and learning started. And so we did these coaching cycles for I said about four, four to five weeks every day. And here are the results. So over this period of time, you can see there the data all the way to the left was, oh goodness, I noticed that there's some timing on that. That was awkward, I apologize. So you notice in our chart that on the left, we had a lot of instability in our ability to meet this output regularly. Once we set the first target condition, which was that dark blue line, Slowly, we were able to work through some of the items causing variation and get that line more stable. And so daily coaching cycles helped us eliminate some of that variation of those obstacles and allowed that team to be much more predictable and stable in their output. And then once she achieved that first target condition of output, then we raised the bar to that challenge of 300. And what we don't, what I don't show here is we did achieve the 300 over a few more coaching cycles. And additionally, what happened after the results came was that this team leader by the end was coming to find me to say, hey, I can't wait to tell you about what we tried and what happened. So they were excited about what they were learning what they were experimenting with. And even the people on the line, our associates were excited to talk about what they're doing to the point where even now I have one person from this line who continues to grab me and show me what they're doing to try to make their process better every day, just on their own. Another side effect of what happened here is because of our results and it was 20 minutes of my time every day for a few weeks, 
our DOO of our site sees this now as an additional opportunity to engage in improvement activities aside from uh, five-day Kaizen events, which we do also participate in. So now we've got a couple of levers of improvement and we're starting to evaluate as a staff, what kind of improvement do we need to make here? Is this something that is critical enough to pull stakeholders together for an event? Or is this an opportunity to engage a team leader or a supervisor in practicing the improvement kata to improve their process every day for a longer period of time? And it's been really exciting to see this transformation in just a few weeks from a culture where the only way to improve were massive events and people were so scared to experiment or try anything to now where I get people coming to find me to tell me what experiment they want to run today or to show me the results of one in just a few weeks and using just those couple of artifacts. It's been a massive change. And so what's next, right? So we started with one person and the next thing is now let's include the experimenting record in Kaizen events in our tier daily management, which we do now. So we have a PDCA record that's included in these other systems that we have. Uh, we're gonna be updating the, our event sustainment to be more like a storyboard with target conditions post-event and daily coaching cycles to continue those learning cycles and improvement cycles. And then the last thing I'm aiming to do is to improve the coaching kata card in our leadership Gamba walks so that as leaders, when we come to the floor to ask how things are going, we're intentional with asking people, what did you learn from your last experiment? And what are you going to try next? And with all of this, I'm expecting, I'm hypothesizing that we'll have full structures for engaging our entire site in this learning culture. And that flywheel that we'll start will cascade and snowball. And soon I'll have many, many people coming to me to show me what they've been working on and what their experiment is. And that is what I have tried so far and wanted to share with the greater community. And hopefully, you know, one or one or two things from this have kind of sparked thoughts on how you might be able to go get started. Ellie, I do have a question. I am sending it to you now. Lovely. Okay, so I'll read the question. So it's how have you managed situations where you thought someone could be a good cuddle learner or coach and they just outright refused? What a great question. I have been very thoughtful with this about... Um, at first, when I was going to engage people in practicing the improvement and coaching kata, I was of the mind that, you know, everybody should learn this and everybody will will do this. And um, I ran into a lot of resistance, not surprisingly. And what I what I figured out, and this is just my approach with this, um, is that this is just like any other new thing or new new product, new um, process, latest and greatest thing. You're not going to get there by trying to force people to do it. You need to find the early adopters and they are out there. So honestly, when I'm starting with somebody, I do not even worry about the people that just refuse. If you find the early adopters and you get enough of them involved and you show the results, then the people who wait and see will get interested and come on board and there will always be the, that tail of the bar of the bell curve that's just not interested. And I'm, I'm approaching this from the perspective of it's not going to be a requirement necessarily at this time. It's more about engaging the people that can be engaged at this point. I hope that helps. I know it's not, you know, a silver bullet to get all those other people involved, but I, that's where I would start, at least start with the people who want to, because it's enough of a lift to ditch, teach somebody the improvement cut and coach them. Thank you. I see a few more questions. Yes, yeah. there are a few more. Okay, as long as you can see them, we're good. 
Yes. So I've got, how long did it take days to complete a cycle? Um, so I'm, I'm going to infer a little bit about this question. So David, if, if this doesn't answer, please um, add some clarification for me. I'm assuming that you're asking to complete a coaching cycle or an experimenting cycle. Um, and so we did one cycle every day. So it was, it was a lot for the team leaders. So we were very thoughtful about what experiment could they run inside of a day. And if they couldn't, right, I, I did have moments where my team lead had every intention of, of running the step. Um, and then the next day we came in and she's like, you know, I didn't get to it. And that's okay. We, I said, hey, don't worry. What obstacles prevented you from taking the step? And just went through the coaching as normal. But we tried to scope the experiments to allow her to do them within a single day so that we could keep the cycle of learning continually going. And it meant that she wasn't bogged down by the weight of an experiment in addition to doing her job because we still had to perform her normal duties. So we scoped them very small so that she could complete them in a day. All right, then I've got, what can we do when you do not see many changes from the beginning and the people start to demotivate? Uh, that's a great question. And I know I've, I see some fellow coaches on this call. Um, one really challenging thing when you're going to coach somebody through the improvement kata is you have to ensure that they get some quick wins so that they stay motivated. And so part of, part of my job was helping guide this team leader toward paths that I knew would yield some result so that she would stay engaged and stay motivated and want to keep doing it because you're absolutely right. Um, if you don't see any change or any results, it is really hard. So part of my job was to help find those ones, those experiments that would yield something for her so that she would stay engaged and motivated. Oh. All right. Next okay, question. Another... Okay, good. Jared. Yep. So do you now start with Kata and those then help lead to Kaizen events? That's a great question. I haven't yet, but I can absolutely see how that would that would work where you start with, and that doesn't mean that I, that I won't run into that, but we haven't yet, where you start with a challenge and you experiment and you might run up against obstacles that are too big for the learner. And those are great candidates for Kaizen events. Um, how I'm approaching it with events is we write, like I'm in an event this week. Uh, so this is very exciting where we're gonna make a bunch of change. And then every week after, the event, we will set another target condition for the supervisor who is um, sustaining this to achieve even greater results in the context of wherever we are at the time. And then we'll do daily coaching cycles through that sustainment. And if we run into a really large obstacle through that, I'm sure that we'll elevate that to an event. Great question. Kelly, I have one. Um, how do you counter the implementation mindset? How do you counter the, what is that? What do you mean by implementation mindset? Um, let me see if I get a response back. Oh, okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking it means just, right, instead of just put a solution in and be done, that continual learning cycle. But I want to, I want to confirm that that's, if that is the, um, the nature of the question, then it's really hard. And I think, in practicing the improvement kata, another challenge for the coach is slowing the learner down the right amount so that they take the time to really grasp the current condition or set up a good target condition or really take a small step. And I think that is part of what can help with just this implementation mindset where you slow them down enough so they can only take a really small piece of a solution or a, a, a small experiment on something larger that they want to implement. And I think another part of that is when you ask those reflective questions about what experiment they ran. And if you're very, very conscious of their golden thread through the experiment, what they expected, what actually happened in their learning, there's a lot to uncover and dig into there as a coach that helps people see that there's more than just a single implementation path that 
things come up through that experience of trying to implement something that they didn't know about or that they didn't expect. And you can highlight those as learnings to then carry forward into a future experiment. So I hope that helps answer. Thank you. Um, I'm from Amanda. What do you feel is the best way to integrate this into Lean Six Sigma training? Because um, another healthcare person. That's a great question. You know, and I, I mentioned it a little bit early on, but I think that there is an opportunity for marrying Six Sigma and Kata in the sense that I think about Six Sigma as ways to reduce variation in your system. And a lot of that can be done with some statistical analysis. And every analysis could be considered an experiment to understand the data a little more deeply. Or when you, when you see that you've got five variables that affect an outcome, those are all obstacles. And then you can pick one, run an experiment on it and see what happens and learn from that and then go to the next one and the next one. So I really see that the obstacles and experimenting mindset in Kata marry up very nicely with Six Sigma and variation reduction. And I think it's just how we talk about it, that you know, doing that statistical analysis helps us see those variables, but then the only way to know for sure how much they affect a given process is to try it and take one at a time, just like one obstacle at a time. All right, I've got two minutes and maybe three or four questions. So do you experience challenges from the leadership when experience fail, experiments failed? Um, so in great news, no. And I'll tell you how, how I did not get pushback or challenges from leaders when an experiment failed. Um, because as a coach and as a person trying to help create the space for learning, when I talked about or we talked about an experiment failing to a leader, I would help frame it as positively and excitedly as I could about what we learned from that and now what that knowledge was going to allow us to do in the next experiment. So a lot of it was from, from me bringing that kind of energy and excitement about a failure and helping frame how that failure really helped us learn even more about the process so that we would get an even better result in the next experiment. And that over and over again, and I tell you, it's a lot of energy, it's a lot of effort, but it's so worth it. Uh, Kelly, I have another one. What are some of the tips to persuade for a new company which might start a Toyota Kata approach? So to persuade a company, there, I think there are a few different ways. And I think Mark Rosenthal has talked a lot about um, how to encourage companies to do this. And to me, it's a lot about start small, demonstrate the results. And if you can convince one person to allow you to try this for a period of time, even a small period of time, and demonstrate the change in not only the results of what you're working on, but in the people that are engaging in it. That's where the big benefit is. And it's hard to, right, I think, Practicing the improvement kata is a little bit of a leap of faith because it's sometimes difficult to, to have a list of results that are going to come from it because you have so many intangibles from a cultural and a people side. So that's what I would try to do. And also it's really not that different from practicing lean or Six Sigma. It's just about framing it. Um, and I know there are a lot of videos from Mike Rother, Sheila Schwartz, Mark Rosenthal about you know, how does scientific thinking help an organization succeed? So those are great resources as well to just spark that um, curiosity about the system and how it might be beneficial for an organization. But the best way is to get a small, either one person or a small group and just see, see what you can do with that and then demonstrate the results. And Skylar, I know we're at time, so I don't know how many more things you'd like me to try to answer. I'm happy to, but I want if, to respect people's time. If you want to answer a couple more, you are more than welcome. Okay. Where am I? I'm at another question from Jared. So, okay, I've got, how do you as a coach help the learner identify the first small experiments that could lead to small wins without telling them the experiment to use? What a good question. So 
that's a, that's a tricky one, right? That's a delicate balance to walk. And I think at this point, the when you are looking at obstacles, because that's where we experiment, is against obstacles. There are probably some obstacles that will jump out at you as a coach that'll be a little easier for a learner to experiment against first. And you may be able to see initially from experience, um, if it's something you've done before or seen, the magnitude of the impact it's going to have. And so one subtle, like gentle way is to, when you ask about, okay, which one obstacle are you going to work on now? Um, there's some deepening questions you can go with there to help guide that learner about which one specifically may be more impactful. Things like what will the impact of, of that obstacle? What is the impact of that obstacle on the process that you're working on? And how does that impact relate to the other obstacles so that it helps them think about it in that framing? Um, and, and sometimes you, you have to just let them pick an obstacle and experiment and they'll learn about the impact of that. And it's okay if it's not, you know, a, a big massive result as long as they're learning and they're engaged. And a lot of that's going to come from how you come into a coaching cycle. Okay. I have another one that came in. How did you handle okay. documenting the process, current, future, and metrics process outcome? Ah, uh, good question. So in great news, you saw in some of those pictures, um, I had my learner write down experiments on the PDCA sheet. So that's our documentation. So we have everything that was tried exactly when and what exactly happened. So we've got a paper trail there. And then results um, were, we were measuring them as a business otherwise anyway. So then we just made a run chart so we could show those results. Um, from a, you know, a regulated um, industry and business, now, after those experiments, now it's about take what has happened, what has changed, and go through your standard document updating process. So we have our standards here about how we update documents for our quality systems. So once you have those initial um, experiments done, you have that, that paper record of what they've done, then you can take that and really solidify it. All right, and I think this is our last question. What does sustainability look like with this improvement caught example? Will you continue to be involved coaching the lead once the target is achieved? What a good question as well. So in an ideal way, my aim is to um, be the first to inject this into um, a team or a, a person at this point. And then the goal is to back away by having their leader, their direct leader, come into the coaching cycles and observe. And so I had the supervisor of this team leader observe some of my coaching cycles so they could see what it was about, how it was handling them, and, and that sort. Because the ideal state is that I am coaching those people to be coaches. And so the next step for me in that context is to get the supervisors involved in their own challenge and have them practice. And I will coach them and work my way through the organization until we have this beautiful chain of coaching and learning. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you to everybody who attended today's session. Kelly, as always, it's always a pleasure talking to you. And everybody, have a great rest of your day. We will see you later.